Hello, good morning. My name is Isabel Migoya. I'm very happy to welcome you to this first breakout session of the North Capital Forum. First, I want to start by thanking our sponsors for believing in the North American way. A special thanks to the Bay Area, Economic, Bay Area Council Economic Institute for their support in the realization of this panel. So here's the format so you know what to expect. There is no seating arrangement, so you can come in and first come, first serve. The panel will last 75 minutes. During the Q&A, we ask you to come to a microphone that is right here, introduce yourself, and keep your question short and to the point. Now, it is my pleasure to, to welcome you to the panel, North American Lessons in Technology and Entrepreneurship, and to introduce you to Sean Ranfall, who will moderate this conversation. Thank you, Sean. The floor is yours. Great. Th thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. I'm sorry. Uh, somewhere behind me, I would turn around if I could. But uh, thanks for joining the first session of the conference. Um, and obviously, they're going to be spectacular sessions, but this is the best. Uh, <laughs> we've got an amazing group. And the, the theme that we're exploring today is really innovation and entrepreneurship potentially as a binding force for North America on this theme of the North American way. So we're going to explore that in, in a bit of detail. And just a, a word of background about how we came into this conversation as the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. So we're a think tank in San Francisco. We focus on the San Francisco Bay Area, Silicon Valley, and California economies. And we're a part of the major business organization in the region, the Bay Area Council. So that's the world we look at it from. And last year, we produced a report on innovation in Mexico. And the US Mexico Foundation was a fantastic partner for that. We're very, very grateful uh, for the support we got and the introductions to many partners and many sources of information. And we couldn't have done it without them. And the goal of the report was really at, at, at two levels. One was to help to change the image of Mexico among a lot of Americans, those who read our reports at least, or you know, I think you would ask a lot of people in the US, quick answer, what, what do you think of first when you think of Mexico? And they might say, oh, um, undocumented uh, aliens and uh, cartels and, and really great beaches. Well, so we know there is so much more going on than that, and people don't think about Mexico as a source of entrepreneurs, as a source of innovation as a place where technology happens. So that's where we really focused. And what we found at a high level was that, at least at the moment, the priorities of the national government don't seem to be so much on technology and entrepreneurs and innovation, but that the action really has developed at the city and state level. Places like, like Mexico City, Guadalajara, <coughs> uh, Tijuana, Ensenada, Mexicali, Armen Juarez, Chihuahua, uh, Monterey, of course, and, and we were seeing really interesting things happening in Merida and also around El Bajio. And, you know, leaders and companies and universities that are very focused on supporting growth through technology development and through uh, in innovation. Uh, so we see this as a tremendous opportunity to grow the relationship in, in, in North America. Uh, we found a few things that were really encouraging and some challenges. One was a lot of, this was really last year, 2021, tremendous growth in venture capital, a lot of startups, a lot of fast growing companies, especially in FinTech, but some issues. Not a whole lot of R&D, not a whole lot of value added around manufacturing, which is a strength in Mexico, and not as large a footprint for Silicon Valley as you would expect in Mexico outside of Guadalajara. So these are real opportunities. Uh, opportunities to grow, the, to grow the footprint, and especially as we're looking at the realignment of global supply chains around technology, opportunities to bring these things together. Which brings us to our panel, uh, and I think we can cover these topics very, very well in the time available. Uh, our, our speakers are our Andy Sow, who's the Managing Director for Global Gateway at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, really leads globally uh, their, their, their technology connections for startups. Uh, Lynn Berstow, who's the founder and managing partner of Mita Ventures, and she runs a terrific startup conference in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, Marcel Villano, 
who is the CEO of Mobi724, which is an AI-powered uh, fintech company based in Montreal that has Mexico City as a hub. And then Alberto Villarreal, the managing director of Nepanoa, uh, which is based in Chicago and helps U.S. manufacturers establish themselves in Mexico, including technology companies. So there's a lot to think about uh, that's going to come out of our discussion. And I think we'll start off with you, Andy, if that's okay. Um, could you give us your perspective on, on what you're seeing uh, around startup and entrepreneurial activity in Mexico, and, 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 as well as Latin America? Because we're seeing more startups from here expanding into Latin America and Latin American startups coming here. So what are you seeing around entrepreneurship and startup uh, here in Mexico in particular? Uh, absolutely, Sean. Um, first of all, thanks uh, to you and um, to uh, the uh, foundation for, for having me here today. It's great to be back. This is my third uh, trip to Mexico City this year. Um, and I was just in Sao Paulo last week, so there's a lot of activity going on in Latin America. Again, my name is uh, Andy Tsao. I'm a managing director at Silicon Valley Bank. I've been involved with the bank's international uh, expansion over the last Gosh, getting close to 20 years now, which is hard to hard to believe. Mm -hmm. um, the bank, for those of you that don't know it, know us. We are the bank for the innovation economy uh, in the U.S. and increasingly globally. We're exclusively focused on the tech sector, starting with startups and scaling with them, uh, you know, into infinity. Uh, we bank more than half of the tech company, uh, venture-backed tech companies in the U.S. and probably two-thirds of the investors that, um, that work with those, those startups. Globally, um, we're present now in, um, in Canada, in uh, Europe, in uh, China, and um, my team has been covering new markets where we don't have a physical presence, and that started with LATAM, uh, but it also includes India, uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Australia, and New Zealand. New markets where we saw the, you know, a decade ago when we started, the ingredients for our business, which is rising tech entrepreneurship, inflows of international venture capital. And we noticed that immediately back in you know, sort of 2010, 2011 timeframe when Silicon Valley investors began to wake up to uh, really Brazil at that time. And so you had you know, top tier firms like Axel and NEA who were looking at the opportunity in, in LATAM and in Brazil and beginning to fund some really interesting companies. So we took our first trip um, in 2012 and uh, saw the incredible uh, talent of, uh, talented entrepreneurs and the huge opportunities that these companies were chasing, in part because you know, the, the infrastructure and the day-to-day, -day, the daily challenges that, that society faces here, especially 10 years ago, um, you know, innovation, digitization was really going to, going to address. And so, um, so that, uh, that, that sort of started our journey. Um, 2013, actually, um, uh, Lynn has a, a role in that. Uh, my first trip to, to Mexico to really um, spend time in the innovation ecosystem was 2013. I attended Lynn's uh, uh, Meta conference, which if you have an opportunity to, to go, you, you absolutely should. It's fantastic. Um, and, you know, my observations for Mexico at, at the time, uh, and, and keep in mind these were the early days, and uh, Lynn, sorry if I'm, I'm going to step on anything you're, you're going to cover, but that was, uh, if, you, if you remember in, at that time, uh, the, government, the Mexican government was beginning to fund um, innovation. There was Startup Mexico, there's an INADEM program that began to form the basis of the innovation ecosystem here. And you know, fast forward to where we are today, where many of those funds um, are, are a significant funders of the, of the uh, Mexican startup ecosystem. Uh, so in my mind, a, a program that, that certainly helped to stimulate the, the ecosystem. And so um, what, you know, what's happened over the decade here in Mexico and Latin, Latin America, it's been an incredible amount of growth. Um, you know, again, back in 2010, Across the entire region, there's probably less than half of $500 million invested across LATAM. Last year, according to LAVCA, the Latin American Venture Cap Association, $15.7 billion. So that's like a 30x plus in, uh, 
amount of growth in a decade's period of time. Mexico, um, you know, like when you look at LATAM, Brazil ends up being typically about half of receiving half of the dollars. So kind of the largest innovation economy. Mexico typically uh, ranks number two. Uh, I think you saw really Mexico come into its own over the last few years when you saw companies like Kavac, uh, who I think many uh, know as a, a, a firm that's really disrupting the, the, the used car uh, area. And they are now the most valuable uh, private tech company in Latin America. And if you'd said that to me 10 years ago, where most of those were concentrated in Brazil, I would have been quite surprised. And that's one of the changes within Latin America where Mexico has really sort of coming into its own. And there's kind of a regionalization happening. It's not just in Mexico. You can see there's uh, unicorns in Uruguay, in uh, Ecuador, um, you know, Chile and Argentina. And so there's a regionalization. It's not just concentrated in the large uh, tech, sec tech ecosystems like Brazil and, and Mexico. Um, and uh, terrific entrepreneurs. I mentioned Kavak. You know, obviously, uh, there, there are firms like Confio that we got to work with from very early on doing SME lending. There's incredible uh, opportunity there. Um, Usto is a firm that's doing grocery, grocery deliveries. The North American Connection, uh, really interesting. We were here just a few weeks ago, and I met with one of our clients, uh, Draftia, and they are capitalizing on fantasy sports, mm. where, um, and they just rolled out an NFL product for here in Mexico, and uh, in able to um, really build that product out, they raised money from Sequoia Capital, which is one of the top uh, US uh, VCs, arguably maybe the top early stage investor in the world. So there are some of the connections, growing connections between the Bay Area and, and Mexico. I would say that, um, you know, in the way that we work with our clients here, it sort of comes in two flavors. One is a Mexican company like Kavak that is now looking to expand to the world, right? Mexico for the world. Uh, which is kind of more rare, and, and so if they come into the U.S. and Kavak's not coming, you know, they're not launching in the U.S., but if, you, if they were, we could obviously provide them with their U.S. Uh, banking. More commonly, however, are Mexican companies and LATAM companies that have no uh, interest in entering the U.S. market. They want to build a great regional business. So what's the connection to the Bay Area and to the U.S.? It's really around funding. And if you peel back that 15.7 billion I mentioned from last year, most of the growth capital you know, in that number came from US and other international investors. And so we're working with a lot of our uh, Mexican and Latin American startups in terms of their desire to raise funding from, from the US and then we help facilitate uh, that with, uh, with, with banking. Well, that's a great perspective. Thanks very much, Andy. Maybe we'll go to you now, Lynn. Could you share your thoughts a bit more on the ecosystem you see evolving here in Mexico and some of the key trends around maybe venture investing and technologies that are really moving into the forefront here in Mexico? Certainly. Uh, my name is Lynn Bearstone, managing partner of Mita Ventures, and we have been a I think one of the earliest venture funds operating in Mexico since 2014 that really has our thesis to help support the Mexico startup ecosystem, the innovation ec ecosystem, by connecting them with Silicon Valley and other U.S. investors. Based in Mexico City, we were joking, I'm kind of an intercambio, so I'm here in Mexico City and my counterparts here who are originally from Mexico are now living in the U.S. and <laughs> Montreal. But, um, I've fallen in love with Mexico, and it's really um, my pleasure to be here today. I want to thank the organizers and thank the Bay Area Council for participating in conversations like this because I think it's so much more important to build bridges instead of walls, and I think innovation is a great way to do that because it's global and it transcends borders. So Meet to Ventures was really started out of the conference that Andy mentioned. Um, I started seeing, I've been involved in technology since the very, very, very early days. So I have a lot of perspective. I had a startup in Chicago at the early days of the internet. And, um, and when I moved to Mexico, I could just see demographics. You could have 50% of the population under the age of 30. You had an immediate move to mobile. 
and you had universities graduating more uh, engineering graduates per capita than the US or Germany. So to me, in 2012, it was inevitable that Mexico and Latin America would become a powerhouse in innovation. And the other thing that I saw, because I was involved in some scholarship um, nonprofits in the Puerto Vallarta area, was that there were very limited opportunities for advancement for the youth. You could work at your parents' business or you could work for a large corporation. And the innovation economy really gave the opportunity for people to have a different path forward. And I thought that was really exciting and really important. And I wanted to be a part of, of helping foster that growth. So that's why Mita wanted to help work with startups that would provide these employment opportunities, growth, and, and, and just a transformative shift in Mexico so it wasn't purely dependent upon manufacturing, but also an innovation and knowledge economy, which gave more opportunities. So um, in the early days, Andy mentioned, um, it was tough. And you had startups, because at that time, it was the first time that it was really able to start a company with a small amount of resources, thanks to cloud computing and the, the lower cost of starting a business. Um, but it was still very difficult for a Mexican startup to get funding from investors within Mexico. So they necessarily needed to look elsewhere. And it was difficult, because the Silicon Valley ecosystem had, sadly, the perspective, well, if you're from Mexico, why wouldn't we have already done it here in Silicon Valley? So my role with this conference was to show that, first of all, there were a lot of problems to be solved in Mexico and Latin America that didn't necessarily exist in the US, such as FinTech and financial inclusion, and that there were incredible entrepreneurs that really had the ability to do so much with much less than counterparts in Silicon Valley were doing. So um, little by little, this has really grown and evolved and, and, and burst open, really, in 2019. I think that was one of the turning points. You know, it was kind of slow going. And then 2019, SoftBank, which is one of the largest investors in the world, came in and made a $5 billion commitment to Latin America with their LATAM fund. And then they followed that up in 2021 with another $3 billion, so that's $8 billion in the ecosystem. So that helped a lot foster this, the ability for some of the more successful companies to scale. But more importantly, it just woke everybody up. I mean, I'd go to meetings in Silicon Valley with my VC counterparts, and I'd say, you really have to pay attention to Mexico. And Andy knows this, too, because your first trip. And, and I loved having people just say, I can't believe the talent and the opportunities that are available here. But um, then when SoftBank came in, it was like a seal of approval. And then all of the big venture capital funds started having a presence. I'd be in Mexico City, and I'd run into them in the streets or in coffee shops. And it's like, all of a sudden, they woke up. And it's like, there's something going on in Latin America, and I better pay attention. <laughs> and then when COVID hit, it even uh, made that a bigger opportunity because you, were, you couldn't travel, so people opened their mind up via Zoom to see what was available elsewhere. And that shows in the venture trend. So Andy mentioned the figures for Latin America. Within Mexico, the trend was you know, 500 million to 800 million in 2019, or excuse me, 2020. In 2021, it was $3.8 billion. And so this year, first half of the year, is $1 billion invested in Mexico startups. So obviously, economic, macroeconomic trends have slowed this down a little bit. But even first half of this year, we're still seeing more of an investment in startups in the VC ecosystem than we did. It, it's the second best year ever. Uh, and we're only halfway through the year. So we have great potential. We have great companies. We're really getting a lot of things funded here in Mexico and LATAM, and I think the trend is just going to continue. A couple of other important observations I have about the ecosystem in Mexico is that you're having companies that are successful in Colombia, Argentina, Chile, and Brazil that are expanding into Mexico as their second point. And that's really great for the ecosystem, so it really puts Mexico on the radar. And also companies in the US. So Mexico companies had always used Silicon Valley as a bridge for success, and they're continuing to do that. But now I think Mexico will actually be kind of a stepping stone for some of these other really successful companies in LATAM to expand into Silicon Valley and elsewhere in the world. So that's been an exciting thing. We're also seeing 
you know, with COVID, Mexico did not shut down. And so you had a lot of tech talent from all over the world, not just from the US, relocate in Mexico City. If you walk around the Condesa Roma area, you'll hear English as much, as, or German, or whatever, as much as you'll hear Spanish, because it's become one of the more popular areas for people to relocate and do remote working. And what that does is it brings more talent and it brings more ideas and more knowledge into some of these companies. And I think that'll just continue to, to, to elevate the ecosystem in terms of the knowledge economy and opportunities, and even just the way of thinking. It's hard to scale a business unless you've worked in a business that has really had a successful growth. And, um, uh, and I think it was mentioned last night that, um, you know, in, in the talk from Clip that, uh, you know, you, you didn't have in you didn't have scalable companies previously, and now all of a sudden you have eight eight unicorns or eight companies with more than billion dollar valuations that are out of Mexico, and so that gives people number one the vision. It's like if they've done it, and these are, have been done in the last ten years, and some in three years. So it means if they can do it, I can do it. And also, if you're a part of that company, you have the experience. The other really exciting thing that I see coming out of that is that now we have these groups of angel investors that are made up of the successful CEOs of Mexican companies. So they are already, I think it took Silicon Valley a long time to have that ethos where successful companies were investing in others and they were really kind of one-offs. But here in Mexico, these CEOs and these CMOs and CTOs are all getting together and investing in the new generation of startups. So that's a really exciting trend. I'm Thanks. probably taking a lot of time, so we can move on and get to questions in terms of other ones. But if, if you can tell, I'm really excited and I could talk about this forever. So. Well, your, your point was really important, Lynn, about venture funding today, because I think this is true also in Silicon Valley and most of the world. If you read the headlines, it's oh, a terrible time for venture investing, terrible time for startups tightening their belt. And it's so bad compared to last year. But if you look at 2021, that was an extraordinary year for venture investing everywhere. And you know, the spike went like that. And you, if you just take that off the map, this year is a really good year, historically. Um, we're back to where we were in 2020 or maybe doing better. So I think we just need to have that perspective. It's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of capital out there. And it is being deployed, and startups are tightening their belts. But um, it's still going to be a, a very good year by any historical standard. I, I agree. And that's what I tell my startups. They're all asking me. It's like, should we you know, be nervous? And it's like, yes. I mean, the economic, macroeconomic factors are changing. But there's a lot of capital in VC funds along with startups raising, they were raising. So there's a lot of money to be deployed. What's really interesting is that in Mexico last year, most of the money was going toward later stage. This year, total flip. So now it's about 60% of the money is going toward seed and early stage investor, which is totally different than you would see in most parts of the world. But what I found is that Mexico and LATAM investors tend to be risk averse. And so it kind of follows that risk off where they'll invest smaller amounts in early stage companies. It, it, it is curious to me because I would have thought it would be a little bit different, but um, that's a great trend because it is going still toward fostering this new emerging ecosystem. But I think that also means investors are seeing how much can be made in venture investing, which they didn't have that before. I mean, actually it's interesting in, in 2021, 54% of private equity or of, of, of this category was in venture investing versus 25% the previous year. So we're moving from private equity to venture investing in the region, and that's a super positive sign. So Andy and Lynn, what, what sectors is this going into primarily? We hear a lot about fintech, but where's the money going right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> fintech, uh, loud and clear, it's about 40, almost 40% 40 of all the Funding goes into fintech in LATAM. Uh, Mexico, certainly, uh, that is the case as well. Um, other sectors, uh, you know, eat, you know, various flavors of e-commerce are still, um, still receive a lot of uh, funding. Actually, uh, interesting one is, um, you know, sort of climate-related uh, funding as well is sort of coming to the fore too in terms of new sectors. But to 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 Lynn's point in terms of early stage investment. You know, from our view, whether it's LATAM um, or actually across the globe, 
it is uh, the current, you know, the, the current environment encourages uh, early stage investments, a sort of C pre-Series A, uh, and that's true here in Mexico. We haven't seen any slowdown in terms of the number of new entrepreneurs who are just receiving their initial funding. If you think about it, it's a good time to be doing that because you know, valuations have come down. As Lynn said, there's a lot of dry powder to be, de be deployed still, and the new entrepreneurs are going to have you know, arguably plenty of time to sort of get to the point where they need to scale. And it's really the later stage companies are facing the you know, sort of challenges around, hey, what's my valuation? Given that the tech markets have corrected a lot, I know we'll talk about that later. But. So Marcel, so we, we're, we're starting to talk about FinTech, which is right, right up your line. Um, maybe can you give us a bit of a deeper dive on, on the FinTech scene here in Mexico? You've got a hub here in, in, in Mexico City, and uh, you really bring a Canadian perspective being based in Montreal to, to the conversation. So uh, where do you see FinTech going, especially around things like FinTech talent, but also uh, how does all this look from Canada? I'm going to start by practicing a little bit my Spanish here. Uh, gracias por invitarme. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí desde Montreal. Merci de la invitación. Y espero que están teniendo una gran mañana. Ahora iré con mí. And now I will switch back to English. <laughs> Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Before I started the company, I did a entrepreneurship and a mentorship at uh, MIT in, uh, in, uh, in Boston. And before I started the company, I traveled all over the world to, uh, to basically decide. I took uh, almost a year off to decide what I wanted to do. And uh, basically, uh, I've been in the payment loyalty and, and reward space for something like 20 years. So today, I'm, I'm uh, presenting from a Quebec entrepreneur into the Canadian uh, fintech ecosystem. And uh, what we have today, uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of a company called Mobi724. We're an AI-powered fintech company. And basically, what we do is that we monetize uh, payment card historical data. And once we have analyzed the historical data, we can predict with an accuracy up to 82% what the cardholders are going to do with their spending in the following 60 days. So basically, in the, um, in the Canadian uh, fintech environment, billions of dollars are being invested in the Canadian in the fintech uh, environment. And for us, I think one of the uniqueness is even when I started the company, uh, we had no intention of selling our technologies into the Canadian marketplace. Uh, from day one, uh, my idea was to sell our solutions into emerging markets and the LATAM region being phase one, which we are actively doing today. Uh, roughly $25 million US have been invested into our company uh, as of yet, and one of our leading institutional investors is Fidelity, probably a well-known uh, brand. So basically, in the... Um, uh, based out of Montreal. Montreal is an AI hub. We have all the global brands, Amazon, Facebook, Google, IBM. They invest billions of dollars into the Montreal economy. And we have students coming from all over the world that come to Montreal and do PhD in, uh, in machine learning and in AI. So uh, for us, developing our AI capabilities took uh, around three and a half years. But during that time, we had the the privilege to uh, uh, work in collaboration with a Quebec Innovation Lab. I have my own team of people that have doctorate degrees and masters in machine learning, and all the data that we use to develop our technologies come from Mexico. And basically, we could leverage other uh, data scientists and AI uh, doctorate uh, team members from the Quebec government with their lab, and they challenged us over a period of three and a half years to make sure and that we develop the best of technologies that we could export. And I don't want to be arrogant, but I believe we have that today. And we even had access from a supercomputer from the government of Canada to make sure that we could test all the architecture of our technology to make sure that we can deploy this on a grand scale. And uh, one of the um, 
in the, uh, as uh, Sean uh, mentioned, uh, our hub for uh, our footprint in the Latam is here in, Me in Mexico City. I have an office in Santa Fe. And in the past uh, year, I spent personally, uh, I was living here for about uh, six months. I, I love Mexico City. This is a fabulous city. Uh, and I'm coming back here for another six months at the beginning of, uh, of uh, November. Uh, one of the things as well that has really uh, helped us in connect with the right people is uh, the Trade Commissioner in Canada and the Canadian Embassy here in Mexico City and the uh, Commercial Office of Delegation Quebec, the, the Quebec government that has uh, introduced us to key, uh, to key um, stakeholders here in this, uh, in this country. And we talked a little bit about COVID. Uh, you know, when, when you have a company, you can never predict, you know, everything that is going to happen. There are always risks. Who could have predicted uh, COVID? Uh, we were about to launch our company. We had started having uh, some revenues. And then when COVID hit, uh, it kind of delayed and some of the projects that we were about to uh, complete. So uh, the... Um, the AI uh, vertical in the province of Quebec is one of the top five that the government is supporting. So we had uh, the privilege of having the Investissement Quebec, which is an investment bank from the government of Quebec, uh, to uh, um, lend us uh, millions of dollars so that we could continue uh, our company. So now, uh, 15 months later today, we have signed uh, millions and millions of dollars of contracts in more than seven countries in the Latam region. Uh, so we're very, very, very happy um, uh, about that. And today we have uh, global brands to which we have partnered with, to which uh, Visa is from uh, San Francisco. We, we have HSBC. Uh, for all of you that are here in Mexico, you probably know the processors, eGlobal, uh, Prosa, uh, Ingenico, and many other of the leading banks in some other uh, countries here in, in the region. And I find that when I first came here, uh, some seven years ago to kind of, uh, as they say, put your feet in the water to see how open the banks were about teaming up with fintech companies. Uh, I must admit that seven years ago, um, it was not that great uh, to be uh, very uh, transparent. As a matter of fact, I thought we were going to be boycotted before I started my company. So today I find here that the banks, and right now we are working with uh, the leading banks uh, into this country. Uh, the banks are embracing fintechs like I've never seen before. And all throughout the region, and here especially in Mexico, we've been greatly welcomed here. And now what we are doing is our next phase to further the risk because all the research and development were right now fully into the monetization stage of our company. And now we're looking to team up with strategic investors in Mexico that will help us de-risk our growth uh, strategy here in the, in the region. And I have been meeting uh, uh, Mexican uh, uh, family offices and, and uh, investors and last week there were some to my surprise that were actually in Montreal looking for some Canadian for to invest into the Canadian marketplace so for me to conclude on this uh, I, I, I here between uh, Mexico Canada and the US it, I think uh, the ecosystem I think it's greatly advanced for somebody like myself that starts a company but I think uh, with global aspirations that I have I think it is working together with Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. It is about how we can leverage the three countries' partnership to enable co companies, but not only to capture Canada, U.S., and Mexico, but to become leaders on a global stage. And, and to me, uh, this is what the aim is all about. So uh, thank you very much again for having me. Uh, merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. <coughs> Well, thanks, Marcel. One, one of your last points was really interesting on funding. And Lynn had mentioned sort of changes in the environment here in Mexico for funding, more local funding and family funds stepping up more than in the past. So what I'm hearing from you is that sort of the financing for what you're doing, it's not just coming from Canada or the United States you're actually getting local funding here in, in Mexico. Well, that's, that's the objective. And, and to what uh, was mentioned earlier, 
uh, because for us, we've already put in 25 million. We already have global brands as clients. And what you were saying, it becomes a challenge now about valuations. So I think, you know, I, again, I cannot predict what the outcome will be, but I find that we have more traction with family offices at this moment which I think uh, for us have the flexibility and we are not obligated to abide by a very strict VC uh, structure on what they can do and, and, and not do. And, um, and right now for us, uh, we have visibility on when the company is gonna be a bit depositive. So what we are bringing here today, because the focus for us, uh, we're not selling anything in the US or the Canadian marketplace. So it's really a Canadian play, but to market here in this region. So for me, uh, my goal here is to really partner with strategic that can help us accelerate our growth uh, into this region. So, um, uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm, in, uh, I'm in discussions with some uh, um, funding providers. So I'm, I met some uh, this week uh, and meeting some next week again. So uh, crossing my fingers that, uh, you know, everything will go well. But uh, for me, uh, I'm very, very passionate. And, and we're really in a business of really converting cash into digital payment. This is what our company is all about by leveraging AI to do it. Thanks, Marcel. <clears throat> so, Alberto, you, you work in cross-border investment. Correct. Especially around manufacturing. Uh, if we focus a bit on, on technology, what are you seeing happening today around cross-border investment in technology and of course execution is a big part of that so as you work with your companies looking at mexico what 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 are you seeing what are you advising sure well first of all good morning to everybody sean thank you for having me as part of this panel lynn andy marcel it's a pleasure to be with you and thank you as well to the u.s mexico foundation for putting together this fantastic event um, I am Alberto Villarreal. That's in Spanish for everybody. <laughs> it's Alberto Villarreal in English. I respond <laughs> or whatever you feel more comfortable with. Uh, I was born and raised in Monterrey, and I've been in the United States for 20 years uh, in Chicago since 2010. I am the founder and managing director of NEPANOA. NEPANOA is a Nahuatl verb. Nahuatl was the language spoken by the Aztecs that lived here in Mexico City. It was the most important civilization in the pre-Columbian era. And what Nepanoa means, it means to accompany, to be a companion. And that's exactly what we do. We accompany businesses in establishing operations, transforming their operations, and expanding, mainly in the United States, Mexico, and Latin America. To your question, Sean, there's three points that I would like to highlight. The first one is Mexico has changed, okay? NAFTA, which happened 30 years ago, the original one, really changed Mexico. 30 years ago, Mexico was seen as nothing else but hands. That's what we were, purely a manufacturing company. And the best example for that is my dad, he had an English school. For those of you that are from Monterrey, maybe you remember it best. Bilingual educators and simultaneous translators. And you would think that that school was packed with little kids learning English. But that was not the main market. The main market was management and C-level executives for the big companies that you know today, Alpha, FEMSA, Vitro at the time. Well, that market is long gone. My dad, of course, has retired. But what that tells you is that today, you know, Mexico is different. In the last 30 years, we have more educated people. Lynn gave us some great stats about people that are graduating in Mexico, that now speak English, that are used to working in North America. The second piece is that our brains are borderless. How many of us in here work for a Canadian or US company and are based in Mexico? Please, raise your hands. I know you, you're a CFO and you work in Mexico, my friend. <laughs> All right, there you go. So when we look at the data, when we look at you know, Mexico and the capabilities that we have, we're talking about more than 300,000 STEM and ICT engineers graduating every year. And that number continues to grow. When we speak to companies that we help, inevitably the question comes, and it's actually one of the main questions, what about the people? What type of people are we gonna find if we expand to Mexico? What type of people are we gonna find if we go into Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Peru? And you would think, well, 
there may be needs from a technology perspective. We need developers, right? Or we need people, mm -hmm. you know, like in your, in your industry, Marcel, for AI. But we've been surprised lately because we're now getting requests for, no, I need a CFO. Oh, oh, for your LATAM operations. No, 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 no. We need a CFO for our company. And we're looking in Mexico. We need an HR leader, right? So that tells us that we're slowly but surely moving into a place where our brains are borderless. We can work in Mexico just like you, Lynn, right? Just like me, Mexican, living in Chicago. My team is all based in Mexico. And that does nothing but unite our region and foster investment across the three countries. And the third piece is that Mexico is ripe for investing, but it's also a key piece in joining Canada, US, and Mexico. Demographically, we're a young country. Education, it's rising. Infrastructure, we need to work a lot on that, a lot. But about three weeks ago, I can't, two or three weeks ago, I was at IMTS, the largest um, industrial or manufacturing conference in the world, and it was in Chicago. And I was with a group of 50 investors, VCs and private equities. And we did a tour exploring different technologies, additive manufacturing, even management systems, ERPs popping left and right for the manufacturing industry. And the conversations fluctuated, particularly at the beginning, after understanding the technologies, the products, into how does Mexico, LATAM, play a role in your company? And those are questions that weren't being asked 5, 10, 15 years ago in those industries. Today, they are being asked. And now, of course, with the people that we have in this panel, right, have FinTech, or we have AI, we have innovation in general. And you look at Mexico, and you look at Latin America, the different unicorns that we have, Cabac, Confio, Bitso, Clip, we spoke to them yesterday. I'm sure I'm missing more. They're mostly focused on FinTech. So if you really look at those two areas, we're, like, we're talking about taking advantage of what Mexico has been for the last 30 years, which is this manufacturing hub, really high-skilled engineers, great people. Retention rate is super high. It's 60% higher than than in the United States. But you also have this innovation piece of young entrepreneurs willing to make a name and to solve the issues that we have in the region in Mexico and the US. And where is that capital coming from? From North America, Canada, US, coming to Mexico. So that's the role that Mexico plays in this integration between Canada, US, and Mexico. And it's all because of the people that we have here and the demographics. That, that, that we live in today. That's an important point around talent, and Lynn touched on it too. So maybe can we stick with that thought for a moment? One of the things that we saw in our work on Mexico last year was this enormous level of production of engineers, but really high quality engineers sure. across Mexico. So surprising to me, lots being produced in, in Tijuana. Um, of course, Monterrey, Mexico City, around the country. And sort of the, the, the evolution and the development of, of, of startups coming out of universities, but some spinning out of existing companies as they were seeing entrepreneurial opportunities. So when you, this is for, I think, you, Alberto, but anybody, when, when you look at the, the talent base in Mexico today, what what do you see? How is it distributed sure. across Mexico? Because it's not evenly distributed. And, and what do you think needs to be done in Mexico or between Mexico and partners in North America to continue to, to upgrade and, and actually take advantage of that talent base? Sure. So, Sean, um, we've been blessed to help companies in different industries, of course, manufacturing a lot of plastics, metals, um, you know, technology, of course, even financial institutions. And Mexico is divided, right? You know, or, or, or the talent is divided across the country, right? It's to nobody's surprise that most of the manufacturing capabilities in Mexico are in the northern part of the country, right? You mentioned Tijuana, you have Monterrey, you have Saltillo that is growing tremendously. Mexicali has always been there. When you look at technology, right, you have Guadalajara, Querétaro, right? In Guadalajara, pretty much all the, all, all the big companies are playing there. So it's funny because when we talk to companies that, you know, from the technology perspective, want to go to Mexico, like, but I want to be in Guadalajara. And I was like, yes, you can be in Guadalajara, but just mind you, it's going to be more expensive. Why? Because everybody's there. And there's also talent in Querétaro, and there's also talent here in Mexico City, right, in Guanajuato, right? So 
from those two industries, we see a lot of talent in the north and a lot of talent in the, in, in the center. Now, the southeast of Mexico, I think there's opportunities there. You know, to your question of what needs to be done. We need to build the infrastructure. We need to train people there, right? You know, as long as we have the talent, the jobs will be there. And I think the southeast of Mexico is a great area for opportunity to start developing, right, people so that companies can start establishing over there. You know, one of the interesting things we, we saw also was that um, Silicon Valley companies were very heavily concentrated in Mexico City, but sure. not much of, of anywhere else. But you, you find the talent in many other places, too. And when I think of cities like, like Monterey, that we don't have a very big footprint in, in, in Monterey, but you know, you've got tech there, you've got all this infrastructure, and we understand like companies like Google and Facebook come to Monterey regularly, and they recruit a lot of people, and they take them north. Yeah. It's great, but the question in my mind comes, well, uh, what's the opportunity to actually kind of establish a bigger footprint yeah. In, in other cities across Mexico yeah. and, and utilize and develop the, the talent there. Because right now, it, it's, it's constant. The activity by our companies is concentrated largely in one place, but kind of the opportunity in terms of the spread of talent, it, it's much wider than that. Definitely, Sean, yeah. definitely. And we have local governments you know, trying to, specifically the Nuevo Leon government, right, trying to attract those companies and attract that talent there. We have great universities here in Mexico that are looking into solving that issue as well. So hopefully we'll get there soon. Yeah. I'd like to comment on that too. Um, I think a lot of the focus has been on Mexico City because most of the investment in the companies have been in FinTech. And I, I, I kind of, when I look at Mexico, I look at Mexico City as being similar to New York in, the, in terms of the businesses that are here, are financial services, entertainment, media, things like that. Guadalajara also has a very strong footprint. And there are more deep tech sorts of companies, a lot of AI, a lot of med tech, uh, different things. Um, Border has really grown, especially in the last year, with supply chain technologies and enterprise. I mean, with everything going on in the world right now and, and the US understanding that they want closer supply chains, and I know that's a big topic at today at this conference. That has really exploded on how to make these traditional manufacturing businesses more efficient. But then you have odd pockets like Merida. I mean, Merida has an exceptionally strong robotics community. And I, I kind of trace it back to one individual, Alberto Munez, who has this robotics school and a robotics company, but he has inspired this whole generation. I mean, these kids in Merida are winning global robotics competitions, global robotics competitions. So number one, it shows the impact that one person can make in fostering an ecosystem of technology. So if you're in tech, dedicate part of your time to fostering and bringing up uh, young people and to making them feel excited about it. But I mean, uh, and then Guanajuato has the aerospace one, but you know, you do have, it's interesting. And I think as technology and other, I mean, FinTech needed to be solved because there was such a low level of financial inclusion in Mexico. But as other problems start to be solved by technology, you'll see a lot of talent throughout the country in different areas. Yeah, and, and to, your, to your point, to me, when I hear that, you know, Google comes here and people from Mexico are most likely potentially moving to the US, I find that too bad because it's a lot of huge wealth building into Mexico as a, as a country. You know, in, 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 uh, in Canada, to develop the AI, a vertical that we have in Canada. It was probably 10 year plus in the making to uh, to have something today that is generating billions of uh, billions of dollars into economic development. And what I see here that is happening in Mexico today, I say kudos to everybody that is really working very hard. And and I was very impressed the last uh, 18 months since I've been coming here to see. Uh, all the entrepreneurial spirit that I've been able to meet a lot of entrepreneurs myself. But I, I, I will uh, just say this last comment. I, I think uh, Mexicans, they have the capacity to become a, a even, create even more wealth that they have today. And technology and other sectors are some of them. And, and, and I think that you have to be, uh, keep in mind that, you know, People could be staying here and have huge 
value creation jobs. And right now in, in the province of Quebec, we have an election and the last government that came, in, came to power, it was actually the first time in my life that I was actually hearing somebody from the government saying, you know what? We're tired of having low paying jobs. We want in Canada, in, in, in Quebec, to have people that are going to be making a minimum of $45,000 a year. And before that, it was like 25. So these are long-term strategy, and it's working. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of wealth uh, uh, to be created into this uh, country. And coming here, I, I see there's huge potential uh, in this uh, uh, upside in this country that, that has not been tapped yet. And, and I see great things. Uh, I see them today, and, and there's, a lot more, there's a lot more to come, but it needs to be planned out. It's not something that happens by coincidence. Sean, I'm curious in your work and your research that you've done, uh, the role of government in fostering it. Andy brought this up, that Ine Dem, the organization that fostered a large part of the early tech ecosystem that no longer is active today. What, what did you find? How, how important is government in fostering this? And Good question, Lynn. We, we, we found it was actually very important. And, and um, guess what? One thought first on the manufacturing question, that it, it does seem that, uh, and the government has a role in this too, that Mexico has done a, a, a terrific job, especially along the border, in, in developing and fostering you know, very efficient, high quality manufacturing. And they've invested in reinvestment in that niche and it works, but what hasn't happened is value added, like more R&D. And I think part of the image of Mexico, kind of the next big leap is, to move beyond the focus, never, you never abandoned it, but beyond the focus on highly efficient manufacturing to bring in more local value added, uh, more R&D, which really will anchor more of this technology activity in, 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 in Mexico. And so that, that does get to the role of government. One of the things that, that we thought was really interesting was in Guadalajara. So it was a huge manufacturing base for the US, and then, guess what, early 2000s, China joins the WTO and the manufacturing is hollowed out. It moves pretty much en masse to China. And the community there needed to figure out, well, what do we do now? And there was a really a coming together of, of the government, being the city of Guadalajara, the state of Jalisco, with the universities there, with the business community about a, a strategy. How, how do we move to a, a higher level of value added? Uh, research in manufacturing, but also the conversation started to move into entrepreneurship and, and other kinds of sort of technological advancement. And, and I think that's worked well for 20 years now. And I think it helps to explain in part why Guadalajara has been so successful in attracting technology companies and now in generating startups um, and actually drawing startups from other parts of North America there. So I, I think it, it applies to other places a, a, across Mexico that uh, I think it's really important in, in, in cities and states that want to do similar things to have a, a, a deeper conversation and alignment between government, whether it be the state government, the city government, very importantly with, with the university system and, and, and with businesses. Yeah about the objectives, like what are the priorities, what do you invest in, how do you present yourself? Because mm -hmm. it, it, it is a moment of opportunity, and I think uh, you mentioned Merida. So we found really interesting things in Merida. Um, uh, you know, they have an ambition to be an offshore IT center on a modest scale, but a lot of that was coming from you know, an alignment and support from the government but really coming out of the universities there with a really strong university capacity that's really focused on that. So I think at the end of the day, it's the companies that will make the decisions, but uh, I think the game can be advanced a lot uh, if there's a, a, a deeper, more structured conversation locally between government with universities, with, yeah. with businesses. And the universities have an extremely important role to play. Yeah. But I don't know what anybody else thinks. Um. I see, you, I see you nodding there, Alberto. I, th I think Andy wanted to speak. He was uh, taking a breath. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say, if you look at sort of globally successful government 
sort of interventions or stimulus of of technology ecosystems, you'd have to look at um, Israel and their kind of yeah. Yozma program, right? And I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I think um, when Mexico introduced their INADEM program, it's sort of thinking along the same lines, right? How do you seed the ecosystem with capital so that these fund managers can begin to invest into the ecosystem? Some, of course, you know, you know didn't do great, but some flourished and it really, you know, began and really drew us, uh, Silicon Valley Bank in because we saw so many new fund managers popping up that were saying, hey, uh, we could use some help. We need, uh, we'd love to uh, work with Silicon Valley Bank. And um, you, know, you, you look at other vehicles that, uh, here in Mexico, like Fondo de Fundos, which is, again, another you know, sort of government-related entity that, that provides capital. And I think in the early days, now you can't, you know, you can't um, continue to support the ecosystem forever. As the Yozma program, the government sort of pulled back after a few years and let the ecosystem run it on, on its own. I think we're we're kind of getting close to that point here in Mexico, but there's certainly a role for um, early days of particularly getting capital to to so much needed uh, areas. So, Manian, to follow up on that, I love the conversation that we're having because we're talking about Mexico and its regions. Right. Many times when we speak about Mexico internationally, we think of Mexico just as a big chunk of land. And in the end, you know, we're talking about 130 million people. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's a huge country with different regions that has different capabilities. Um, what I'm going to say, you know, it's good, but it's also bad. Right? You have local governments really doing an effort and working with local universities to get people prepared for these types of jobs. We mentioned Merida. We mentioned Nuevo León and Monterrey before. Well, Merida and Yucatan, of course. I know Chihuahua is doing a great effort there. Of course, you know, the state of Mexico, Mexico City. And it's great because you have the local government, so it means that it's focused. But the bad side of that is that, well, it's also regionalized, right? You know, so we continue to invest and to, you know, build these companies in the same regions as we have before. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot of country left, guys. There's still a lot of people <laughs> here. So I wish that uh, we could move into a place where both government, university, and also, of course, the private sector would collaborate to bring people from all those other states up as well. It would only bring more business into our country and more opportunities for the people. Absolutely. We have time for some questions. So we'll maybe pop it off to the audience for your questions and comments. There's a microphone right here. So if anybody wants to comment or ask a question, please just come up to the mic and we'll, uh, we'll take the questions. Please. Yes. yes, yes, we can. Well, thank you for, all, for the conversation and all the panel. I'm Fabricio. I'm from Monterey. I'm a co founder from uh, InsureTech, health okay. insurtech sector. So, my question is what's your perspective on the InsureTech funding uh, from now onwards? We've seen all the boom for fintech and the uh, financial inclusion problem we have here in Mexico, but there's a big problem here. 90% of the population doesn't have access to a private hospital, doesn't have access to uh, medical insurance. So what's your perspective you know, on, on this area and uh, uh, funding for uh, insurance? Thank you, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, what I, FinTech has been solving basic problems, but as I think it'll continue to grow, but what we're seeing is more specialization in FinTech, to, yeah. exactly to your point. So now fintech has been, I heard somebody say, pretty soon every company will be a fintech company. When you see Amazon and Uber have payment systems inside of there, they're fintechs. But insurance is a huge, huge issue to be solved. I mean, that property tech is another area too, which insurance relates to. Um, that is one of the fastest growing segments of funding in Mexico and LATAM because um, real estate, for those, from the US, it's like people may not be familiar, but you usually buy real estate 100% cash here. So there are more interesting ways of buying real estate, both commercial and residential, renting properties, cars. That's why Kavak, I think, had such success because it has a FinTech component to it. So insurance is, falls into that. So it's, you know, I, I think it's, it's one of these creative ways of, of providing different financial services uh, for people who have been left out of that system before and greater accessibility to those services. Thank you, Thank you for your question. Thank What's your company? Uh, Yoko. It's called Yoko. Okay. 
Hi, thank you for your uh, excellent uh, panel. Uh, I am Salma Khalife from Centro Mexico Digital. It's a think tank. Uh, I want to make a comment and, and a question. The comment is that we are about to publish the second year of our index. It's an index, a state index for Mexico in digital uh, development. So it would be useful for you to know what's going on in the ecosystem in each of the states of Mexico. And I agree with you. Uh, the regions that you pointed out are the regions that are more successful in, in fintechs. And uh, the question is that, it, how do you feel about uh, the regulation, the, the regulatory uh, environment in Mexico? Is it promoting the startups or we need to do more in order to, to move faster in this, way, in this uh, um, area? Anybody? I can take a stab at that one. Um, thank you very much for your question. Really appreciate it. And looking forward to your report. So, yes, we could be doing way more. You know, it was actually mentioned last night in the Red General session as well. Um, it's difficult to start a business anywhere. It's difficult to start a business in Mexico. <laughs> you know, uh, from, from an infrastructure perspective, from a support perspective, um, it's very um, siloed. It's, it's, it's difficult, even from the inception of business, right, just to get it registered, just to open a bank account, right? You know, if, if you're a foreigner trying to open a bank account in Mexico, it would take up to eight weeks. No joke, guys. No joke. We do this for some, for some of our clients. There's banks solving that, which is great. But yes, if we could facilitate not only the startup ecosystem, but just investment in general into Mexico, um, Mexico's growth would be way greater than what we have today. The situation that we're experiencing today with nearshoring and with the startup ecosystem that we just discussed, it's, it's ripe, right? I mean, the time for Mexico, it is now. The next five to 10 years are gonna be key for the next 50 in this country. And I wish that we were doing more to make things easier for the investors and entrepreneurs that are, that are thinking of operating here or that are already operating here. Other thoughts on that? For me, I have a policy not to comment on governments and outside Canada <laughs> as, a, as a policy, but I can only say that, you know, if I look into Canada in, uh, or in Quebec, where I've been living for the past uh, 25 years or so, um, it's a gradual thing. It's uh, 25 years ago in, in, uh, in Montreal, because I've started a, a few companies, it was very tough. I was seeing in the, in the last five or 10 years is getting easier. I think the ecosystem that, that is being built here to support entrepreneur, uh, from what I understand uh, from it, it's, 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 it's already excellent to start. Do, do we want things to go faster? Everybody does. But, uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, to me, uh, uh, governments always play a role uh, in stimulating or sucking up the air for entrepreneur in, and it varies from country to country so i would say you know for me as an entrepreneur no country can ever go too far in supporting uh, capitalism or entrepreneurship in any country so i will just say that thank you for a um, quick observation uh, with the many fintechs that we work with and you think of how many um, whether it's here in mexico or in brazil end up being neobanks um, or lenders that really require becoming a bank over time, like uh, CLAR here in Mexico is a good example, became a bank to be able to have lower cost of funding to be able to lend. And so that requires a central bank that's going to be friendly um, and because you have really big competitors here, right, against some of these fintechs. And I, I certainly think while there could be more uh, done, um, You've seen the central banks, both here and in in, um, in Brazil, really, you know, sort of being uh, fintech startup friendly, which is great. I'll just add because I'm, I'm not shy about these things that there's a pretty wide perception outside of Mexico, maybe in Mexico, that um, the government, the national government, really hasn't prioritized foreign investment or technology development or especially entrepreneurial activity in startups. Now, it may be that the system now has achieved enough momentum on its own, that it's, it's starting to roll 
but the perception is that there could be sort of a more affirmative posture by the government yeah. to enable startups yeah. to grow in the way they need to grow. And that there's obviously a regulatory aspect of that when you get to banking um, and other things as well. But um, I say that the perception is that more could be done. Agree. Please. Uh, I have a thought about talent because we were mentioning it. I mean, I'm from Guadalajara, so yeah. A lot of companies right. want to be in Guadalajara because of the talent itself. And I work on helping democratize the access to prosthesis for people with an amputation. Okay. The thing here is that we lack 20x the amount of people needed to attend people in Mexico with that need, right? The problem is that uh, with the matter of talent, there is a lot of talent in the US, Canada, who has that knowledge, and it's very specialized into that area. But in Mexico, we lack of that talent because we don't even have a career in that area. Well, it just begin again, but they miss like two years more to be able to be there. Plus, the talent that is being hired is coming from El Salvador, Colombia, Brazil, or even far away, since we don't have the right like amount of people needed to, this, to do this. So how can one of the topics is the investment itself and how we have a lot of talent and entrepreneurs here, but how can we actually also foster the mix of talent coming from different parts, but also to work in Mexico so Excellent. we can actually develop it because we need it. And there is a lot of knowledge in, out there, but we only have from the south part of it, which is good, but there is also another one from those areas that we don't have. So we also have to attract talent, talent from North America itself to come from the US, Canada, to be able to actually revolutionize yeah. it because, because there is this huge need. So yeah. any thoughts on that? <laughs> I think, were you talking about that earlier, Lynn? Well, I, I, I have one thought. I mean, I, I do think that um, the media in Mexico can do a lot more to tell the stories and share yeah. the stories about what opportunities there are instead of focusing on the traditional businesses that they have always supported them. Sorry to say this, but you know, sure. and I, you know, and I, I see that. And I also think, I mean, one of what, something that's near and dear to my heart is diversity in tech and women getting more women involved mm. in tech because I think sometimes they think, oh, tech, it's boring. I don't want to be there, but we need to have, and Guadalajara is just a fantastic community for really fostering that there's a great community ecosystems and sharing and university, Tech de Monterey in Guadalajara is super active, but um, I'm, I'm actually surprised that you're, that you're having those struggles of talent in Guadalajara because that is probably one of the richest areas and most evolved communities in terms of, of sharing opportunities of tech. So mm -hmm. I, but I, I do think, the more all of us in tech get out there and talk about the opportunities and talk about the paths, I mean, there, there, there are people in Mexico. I mean, that's, you know, it's like, so uh, you, you, you could no. probably talk to that. Let, 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 if I can add, I'm sorry, what is your name? I'm Carlos from Carlos. Proactible. Carlos, thank you very much. Uh, what you're doing is great. I think you're talking also about the regionalization, right, of companies, right? You, you mentioned, hey, getting talent perhaps from U.S., the Can Canada, and Mexico to work on your firm. And the... When we look at Cabac, when we look at Bitso, when we look at Clara, they have people in Mexico, but they also have people in Argentina, in Peru, in Colombia, in, in El Salvador, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, we're talking about regionalization of North America, but also, you know, further south. Um, so I, I don't want to give you a recommendation, but I mean, all these companies that we, that we mentioned, they also employ people in the U.S. and Canada. Actually, one of the companies that I mentioned, I'm not able to disclose it, but acquired a company in the U.S., a Mexican company, one of the startups that I just mentioned that are unicorns, acquired a company in the US, guys, specifically for that, because of the technology and the people. So do see at least this side of the world or globally, you know, as, as your source of talent, you know, as you grow. Doug, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Marcel. Uh, and I would just say, I'm, I'm gonna promote my country here. <laughs> uh, the Canadian Trade Commissioner, because I understood from your question that maybe you could require some expertise or maybe some innovation. And I would say that if you go to the Canadian Embassy, to the, the Canadian Trade Commissioner, they could probably match you up with a company who's already doing something that might be of value to you, and then match you with them. Because Canadian companies, uh, you're 100 and, the US is like 350 million, here in Mexico you're like 130. We're only 35, okay? So we're, we, everything that we do is, is most of the time is exported. 
So one of the things that you're going to find if you call Canada, you're going to find companies that want to export technology or, or innovation that they already have, and maybe there could be a match with the opportunity that you can bring to them, and then you could work together as a team. Okay. And Carlos, the third of the team of Nepanoa is in Guadalajara. So love Guadalajara and the town there. So oh, just okay. anyway. Thank you. Good. We've got five minutes and two more. Three. 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 Three more. <laughs> we'll try to get through as quickly as we can. Okay. It's probably my fault, Sean. I'll stop talking. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. My name is Luis Estrada. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Vienna for your Spanish skills. Oh, are incredible. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. And second, I would like to ask, well, you were talking about uh, how government is helping universities and students, but are there any international mechanisms or tools that support young entrepreneurs in North America? Or what are the challenges behind creating, creating a international mechanism that sure. can support young entrepreneurs? In terms of funding or business like development or? In any kind of support. <laughs> There are international accelerators that have a global focus and especially a Mexico and LATAM focus. And there, there's, there's a number of those around. And their activity is primarily focused in, in, in Mexico and Latin America. So I, I think uh, some are based in Silicon Valley, but a lot of their activity is here. So I, I if can, I, if I can just names. do a quick comment here, like uh, for myself, uh, I'm you know, a, a, deriv a derivative product from an entrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, being from uh, Quebec with the Entrepreneurship Foundation, I was picked in the entrepreneurship program and did a program at MIT in Boston. Uh, and that's where, after that, that I started this company. So, uh, you know, in, in uh, so I would, uh, if, if uh, after the meeting, I can kind of give you a little bit more information on that if you yes. want. Sure. Are you based here? Sorry? In Mexico City? Yes. Yeah. There, there's a, a lot of community groups that are yeah. able to help. And even, we, we were talking about Google taking people out, but I mentor with the Google Accelerator program here that supports at no equity. So they take nothing from the startup yeah. and they support it with AI as a focus. So all through Spanish speaking LATAM, but it, the program is based here in Mexico City to support uh, and give talent and advice yeah. and mentorship to, to programs. Yeah. So there are a number of non-equity accelerators as well as other accelerators yes. that can really help with business development. And I'm happy to talk to you afterwards too. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, good morning. Well, my name is Juan Pablo. I'm a student at Tech de Monterrey. And well, thank you for all the points this morning. And my question goes along these lines of a term we've heard recently about social startups or social oriented startups, right? We might have heard about this startup in Chile called Betterfly that was kind of like the first social unicorn in Latin America. And my question is, what do you think of this space being a solution for many of the problems we have in Mexico? Tough question, good question. Um, I'll be brave. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, um, just Mexico being, being the country it is and, and, and the needs that it has, particularly from a wealth gap, right? Um, financial inclusion perspective. There's definitely, you know, opportunities uh, for companies that have a more social focus to thrive in this country. Um, I, you're still a student, so you, you haven't started anything yet, but I assume that you're thinking of starting something uh, along those we lines. We failed, but we did. You failed, but you did. Okay, good. Well, we did. you didn't fail. You learned, right? That's, yeah, um, <laughs> that's a very good point. There's no so, failure. Exactly. It's just another step to success. Exactly. You, you started with, I'm a student, buddy. Yeah. I, you, look, you know more than I did at your age, so you're fine. Uh, but <laughs> so there's definitely, you know, big opportunities in Mexico for, for social startups, right? You know, the needs are there. I'm sure you have identified them, and um, I would encourage you to, to keep going. I can tell you within the investor community in Mexico, there's an increasing amount of talk about ESG goals, and there's an increasing amount of funding available that helps support socially oriented startups or people who are meeting those. Andy was talking about the increase in funding for climate solutions too, but I think it's important, and I think more and more people understand that it's not just creating a business, and again, so many problems to be solved here. And so you can create a great business out of solving problems that have social good. Yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing about, um, well, not the, one, of the, the, one of the dynamics here in 
Mexico or Latin America certainly is the intersection of both financial return and social impact. And FinTech's a perfect example, right? There's, when you think of financial inclusion of the unbanked here and across LAT LATAM, and what many of the startups are aiming to create a really valuable business, not in, in you know, and by the way, they're doing great uh, social good as well. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's great that you have that dynamic here that you could do both successfully. And then to Lynn's point, I think where it's being driven in, in terms of more, you know, sort of shifting of balance to being aware of things like ESG is really from the limited partner community, meaning institutions are investing sure. in venture capital funds and other institutions say, hey, you know, I want some of my money going to ESG and, and things are going to do good. And that in turn then forces the fund managers to, um, you know, to pay more attention to it. So we have time to fit in one last question. It'll be quick. Hi. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alex Gonzalez. I'm a U.S. and Mexican customs broker. I, am all, I also represent the Association of Mexican Customs Brokers of Nuevo Laredo. Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, Texas is the most important inland port, customs port in, in Latin America. 14,000 trucks across a day. And with the Temec, that number is going to increase every year. So we're going to see 15, 16,000 trucks a day. Um, with the pandemic, our, our industry was hit on, on a sense where there were higher prices. However, on the technology and disruption, what, any thoughts that you can, that you can you know, feed us about blockchain, a single window, a frictionless border that you mentioned? Um, how can you know, entrepreneurs and young entrepreneurs help the, the customs brokers where we can facilitate in a single window, government, importers, exporters, customs brokers, uh, trucking companies, and all those, all those players we need into one single platform for visibility and transparency purposes. Any thoughts? So, Alex, congratulations on, uh, on your business and your position representing that Nuevo Laredo uh, border. We do a lot of business there because of her clients, and um, it will certainly continue to grow. As I mentioned, yeah, our, our brains are borderless, but when it comes to products and manufacturing, we still have a very strict border right there. And it seems that that piece has not evolved much in the last 30 years, right? You know, we're still doing a lot of manual processes, a lot of paperwork, a lot of uh, product just gets stuck in the border you know, for, for weeks, months at some point. Um, I'm glad to hear that, that you're working on it. There's, I know that there's money being invested in companies that are trying to make the border seamless or more um, or faster, right? Um, I actually can think of, you know, three, you know, companies, right? For example, Nuevo Cargo is working on that, right? And they also, um, you know, work on trying to make the world a little more seamless. But I think I want to return the question to you and say, what type of help have you gotten up to now? And what do you think is lacking? Because from my perspective, I see entrepreneurs working on that. I felt the pain of what we're trying to solve. And I also know that there's money invested in it. So what, what do you think lacks to, to speed things up there? Because you so, live it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so right now, um, as, a two, as a 2012, in Mexico, the Ventanilla Unica de Comercio Exterior Mexicano. Yeah. Um, it's a BUSAM. It's a, a digital platform where we, yep. where we upload the documents for import and export. And now we need a platform where, um, where any, any manual data, it's not manual data anymore. It's captured into one system, and that one data could be shared through all the players, okay. customs brokers, importers, exporters, trucking companies, mm. navieras, eh, yep. terminales en los puertos marítimos, and all, all the players into one platform, which will you know, decrease our costs, our operating costs, and increase efficiencies throughout the supply chain. I will say, you know, I had mentioned that supply chain was an issue this year in 2022 that had the second highest amount of funding inside of Mexico, and, and that covers logistics technology. Yep. And I can think of three or four companies that are working on this whole, even interactivity um, within Mexico, trucks going places, so they go one place and they don't return empty, they return with another right. cargo load, and and, uh, and it, it it's... A problem that needs to be solved, and, and as of this year, it, it feels that the money is being invested to help solve that problem. And blockchain clearly is yeah. one of my favorite <laughs> technologies. Yeah, if uh, we can solve the problem of the black hole in the border, 
Um, I think it's a problem that yeah, 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 yeah. Well. yeah. All but right. You could be a Thank great you. advisor. I want to get your name. <laughs> Thank you. Companies appreciate working it. on solving these problems. Yes. And Cargo also, X is, I think, one of those yeah. companies yep, that yep. does that. And you know, the other t outside of blockchain, obviously, uh, IoT, and yeah. so the, the ability to track, um, you know, the various goods and through through technology. New exactly. Yeah. So, and guys, just to compliment that. Um, you know, the, the, the logistics industry from the U.S. and Mexico perspective. You know, the innovation that's happening there, the amount of companies that are coming up, is just amazing from an entrepreneurial perspective, yeah. right? When we look at e-commerce and we look at final mile delivery in Mexico, they're both growing at a double-digit rate. Yeah. Right, and we don't have enough entrepreneurs in that area. So, if there's any aspiring entrepreneurs around here that want to get into logistics, that's that, that's a good industry to be in today, in Mexico and you know U.S. Mexico cross border as well. So thinking about the applications, uh, Gustavo de la Fuente from the Smart Border Coalition in San Diego and Tijuana, he's here at the conference. I don't know if he's in the room today, but you might track him down because they're very focused, especially on the you know the heavy traffic across at San Isidro, and bringing technology solutions to. Uh, uh, to that whole set of issues. So with that, I think we actually are a little bit over our time, but I'm glad we could fit in all, all the questions. And uh, Andy, Lynn, Marcelo, Alberto, thank you so much for what's been a great conversation. Thanks, everybody, for your really excellent questions and comments. And uh, although this was the best panel of the session, we encourage you to attend <laughs> all the others on entrepreneurship and technology. Thank you very much.